What's going on YouTube? It's Deej back again with another video and today we're updating my three round 2023 NFL mock draft starting with round one today then tomorrow will be round two and Sunday we'll close it out with round three and then we get to do it all over again on Wednesday with a full three round mock in one video because then Thursday night we get round one of the NFL draft. If you're excited, be sure to hit that like button. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video as well. And if you're new around here, want to see more football coverage and want to be live with us for night one and day two of the NFL draft, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button. And of course, the most important thing you can do, leave your thoughts down below in the comment section. Who's your favorite team? Did you like the pick I gave your squad? Who went too high? Who went too low? And maybe what are some player to team landing spots that you think make for a good fit? Also, be sure to check out our sponsor for today's video, wrong hand, uh, BetUS. Links are down below in the description. You get a sign up bonus with the first link or a free $50 bet with the second. Definitely check out all their offerings and the BetUS Sportsbook. Thank you to BetUS for sponsoring today's mock draft. But you guys know the drill. Let's go ahead and jump right into it, starting with the Carolina Panthers. I'm going to go Bryce Young. I'm going to I'm gonna go with the uh, betting markets here uh, and say that there is smoke, you know, to this fire. Uh, and to me, this would be the pick I make. He's the best quarterback in this class. You know, I think we all, you know, had a song and dance for each quarterback other than Bryce Young for why they should go one but we've all kind of come back to yeah he's the guy with the best feel he's got the best intangibles and you know may not have the most gaudy athletic you know uh traits kind of like a Joe Burrow of a few years ago not saying Bryce Young is going to be fully as good as Joe Burrow but kind of where it's like yeah this guy's just a gamer and you know he gets the results and you know his feel for the game and his pocket presence in specific for Bryce Young elevate some of the other you know weaker spots maybe in his athletic profile and you know his height and his weight and maybe those durability concerns then at two i'm gonna give houston cj stroud i hear the the rumors of them going someone other than quarterback to me it's like if you're gonna draft a quarterback in this class you do it at two and if you're not drafting a quarterback I asked the question, why? <laughs> do we want to see what Davis Mills is going to do this year? I think we've already seen what you know he is, and I think Mills is better than maybe what some people expected, but uh, not a franchise quarterback. So let's go get a guy who has that potential and guy who is an elite processor and a very accurate passer in that you know Kyle Shanahan West Coast scheme. I am very interested in that fit. And then, you know, I think there's some picks, and we'll address it with the first pick of the second round for Houston, that is, uh, in tomorrow's video. Uh, to get some more playmakers there. So I think you can improve the environment around Stroud to alleviate some of the concerns that I personally have with him going from Ohio State to then, you know, a place that doesn't have a great ecosystem around him. And, you know, like I said, going to Houston, working with Bobby Slowick, you're going to have a good offensive scheme around you. So really like that fit there for C.J. Stroud. And then for Arizona, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I'm going to go Tyree Wilson. Um, to me, I'm kind of getting the feel that Tyree Wilson's either going to be the first defensive player off the board or he's going to be like the sixth or seventh, right? Like either he's going to go three to Arizona, and I'm going to talk about this fit in a moment, or he's going to be going after Jalen Carter, Will Anderson, both corners, you know, Witherspoon and Gonzalez, Nolan Smith, and maybe even behind Lucas Van Ness, making him like the seventh defensive player off the board. To me, it's going to be one or the other. Uh, now, granted, uh, inevitable, you know, like an infinite amount of possibilities here. He could go at any spot, you know. But to me, it kind of feels like he's all in or he's going to slip a little bit in this class. But he's kind of one of those prospects that their landing spots can be really, really interesting once we get to night one of the NFL draft. But here for Arizona, I'm kind of intrigued by this fit. You know, Jonathan Gannon, assuming that it's going to be a 4-3 base. Um, and given Wilson, I think, can move across the defensive line in that four-man front. Uh, he could play edge and be a compliment to Cam Thomas and Maje Sanders, who at this point are still question marks. Or, you know, you get into passive situations, you could have all three of those guys in the field. You know, it's 6'6", 280 plus, and, you know, an 86-inch wingspan. I feel comfortable with, you know, third and long, moving Tyree Wilson inside to play against guards and letting his arm length, you know, fully dictate that matchup. And it's going to be a huge mat mismatch for him to exploit. And then you get to see what Cam Thomas and Maje Sanders is all about. So um, don't think you have quite that same versatility with Will Anderson. Will Anderson would be my pick here. But, you know, I, I think Wilson, again, is going to be the first defensive player off the board, or he's going to slip a little bit. And that's kind of what I want to explore in each of my next two mocks before we get to actual round one of the draft. So Cardinals take Tyree Wilson. Then at four, I'm going to have Indianapolis Colts take Will Levis. It does seem as though they're all in. You know, maybe that again is a smoke screen. Maybe Anthony Richardson's really their guy. Either way, I am all in for one of these toolsy, traitsy quarterbacks going to work with Shane Steichen because we saw him work that magic with Justin Herbert. And that's kind of where I think Will Levis is maybe a fair comp to what that progression curve might look like. Or we saw what Shane Sykin did with Jalen Hurts, and maybe that is applicable to a potential relationship and, you know, a potential draft pick of Anthony Richardson. So I'm fine with either one. I personally have Levis ranked higher, so maybe that is kind of the, uh, you know, tiebreaker here. 
Apologies, don't know why OBS was not uh, keeping up with our selection there. But nevertheless, we uh, move on now to pick number five, Seattle. This one's an easy one. Will Anderson, uh, they haven't addressed edge yet this offseason. I think Will Anderson is the best edge rusher in this class. So uh, again, I would have taken him there at three if I were the Cardinals, but wanted to explore something different. Haven't had Wilson be the first defensive player off the board. And it makes it a layup decision here. I mean, I don't want to say a layup because you could contemplate Carter, but I think in a world where both these guys are available, you're going to take the, the guy with less off the field concerns and you don't have the immaturity, maybe, you know, potential red flag uh, in the mix. And again, the Seahawks haven't addressed edge yet this offseason. So get, go at a guy that could be a double digit sack type of guy year in and year out too. You know, I like Boye Mafe. I like Achenna Wosu and, you know, Daryl Taylor, I guess, has his fans. I'm not really crazy about him, but nevertheless, they have some okay players there. Uh, this is the superstar potential piece that makes all those other guys look that much better and takes that defense to another level. So this would be an awesome uh, you know, occurrence there for Seattle. And I would say the same thing for Detroit here with Jalen Carter. Again, the off the field stuff, yes, there are concerns there, but at the same time, he's a fantastic fit. You get some immediate run defense uh, support. You get a guy who can win with power, also has good hands, can win with some finesse and has a full move set. So adding him to a pass rush that already features Aiden Hutchinson, James Houston was a great story last year. Lee McNeil, who had some big games last year. Derek Barnes, who can blitz from the inside linebacker spot. Yeah, you're talking about having a lot of different options there, and they've already beefed up that secondary. So I think you're going to see this defense in total, especially if you take Jalen Carter here at six, take a big step forward next year. Uh, and I think that's the type of, you know, gravitas Jalen Carter could have on a defense too, being that final missing piece uh, and cleaning up some of the areas where, you know, maybe Detroit's okay, pretty good at when it comes to pass rush and then take him to uh, another notch up and then really assuring, you know, a spot that is kind of a weak area of their defense and run defense. So uh, to me, best non-quarterback in the class. So uh, obviously the off the field stuff is going to have him drop maybe just a little bit, but again, I have a hard time thinking he gets past six to Detroit. And then at pick seven leaves Anthony Richardson still on the board. I thought about a trade up for Tennessee and I trust me, I hear the Tennessee, you know, trade rumors, but I'm going to do something a little different here, and there is going to be a trade later on here in the first round for the Titans. Uh, but Anthony Richardson, you know, Dave Ziegler apparently was the first person to go talk to Anthony Richardson at the end of his pro day, which is interesting. And they're also a team where they have, you know, a quarterback who could start for two years at minimum, at least one year to give Anthony Richardson that time, which I feel like a lot of people think that he needs. I find myself in a different camp, but, you know, I, I could see where the Raiders are saying, hey, we start Jimmy Garoppolo for a little bit of time. We start to, you know, develop, you know, an offense around Anthony Richardson for the years to come. Kind of like what uh, uh, Greg Roman did with Baltimore. You know, they had Joe Flacco starting for a little bit. And then, you know, kind of in the back room, I guess they were making this offense for Lamar Jackson. And then the next year we got to see that. Maybe the same thing could play out here in Las Vegas. Um, now, granted, it wasn't great with, you know, Cam Newton, New England. So, you know, if you're a Raiders fan and you're looking at that as a potential signal to what Josh McDaniels would do with Anthony Richardson, they, that may not inspire a ton of confidence, and I totally understand why. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that Cam Newton was different than, you know, the 2015 MVP winner. And, you know, there's going to be some refining to do with Anthony Richardson. But if you do hit that, you know, upside, this is a guy that could have your team in a position to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mahomes and Herbert. And we'll see what the Broncos are all about next year as well. All right, on to pick number eight. I'm going to give the Atlanta Falcons uh, Devin Witherspoon. Uh, you have Jeff Okuda coming in, but I think Witherspoon could play the nickel and, you know, you're playing nickel more often than not. And, you know, Terry Fontenot at the combine was talking about, you know, 70 to 80% of the time you're playing a nickel. So I think he understands the importance of that. I think Witherspoon could be that immediately. And that's assuming Jeff Okuda is worth playing on the outside, right? Uh, and this could be flipped the other way around where you bring in Okuda, maybe he's your nickel corner and then Witherspoon plays on the outside. Either way you spin it, you bring in Okuda, you bring in Witherspoon. One of these two guys should be a solid starter on the outside, opposite one of the game's best in A.J. Terrell, and you side one of the game's best at safety in Jesse Bates. And all of a sudden, that secondary is looking a whole lot better. And then we're going to go edge to start out in the second round for Atlanta tomorrow. So I think this is kind of the, the draft path that I like to, to follow most with Atlanta. DB, really make that a strength of your defense and then add some edge depth where I think the, the depth of this class really starts to linger into early day two. Next, Chicago. Yes, I, again, I know the Peter Skaronsky love is out there. And, you know, even Darnell Wright. I did think about Darnell Wright here. Uh, but I'm going to go with Paris Johnson Jr. The best offensive tackle in the class, in my opinion. Perfect fit for that zone blocking scheme. He played right guard two years ago. So if you're asking him to flip over to right tackle, I don't think that's something that's going to you know completely uh, derail uh, the type of player he could be. We saw Panay Sewell maybe struggle a little bit during the preseason, but be able to make that flip and, you know, has been one of the better right tackles in football since making that position change. Um, and, and we're starting to get to a point where teams understand both tackle 
positions are important because if you're facing Khalil Mack, he'll move on either side of the line. If you're facing Micah Parsons, he'll attack either tackle, whichever one presents a more favorable matchup. So I, I don't think drafting a guy that's going to be a right tackle maybe for you is like out of the realm of possibilities here uh, inside the top 10. So it could be Darnell Wright. Thought about that. He is a natural fit there at right tackle, but I have all the faith and confidence that Paris Johnson Jr. can make that flip. And I trust the talent. He's the best off the tackle in the class, again, in my opinion. Then while we're talking about Peter Skronsky, I think he's a fantastic fit for that offensive line uh, in Philadelphia. And I think he kind of blends his skill sets really, really well because, you know, the conversation's been, is he going to be a guard or is he going to be a tackle? And uh, I think you could start him at right guard. You know, he's a great mover and to me, the best offensive lineman on the move in this year's class, tackle or interior offensive lineman. So he's a good fit for that blocking scheme. You get to the second level. Um, and he's also a great pass protector who you just pay Jalen Hurts all that money. Would definitely like to see him stay upright. Uh, so I think Skronsky helps out in that area. And then, you know, in a year or two's time, you could shift him over to play right tackle. And then we can see, you know, what this debate really becomes. Because maybe he's like this all-pro guard right away. And then you move him over to right tackle and he's just fine. And then we'll have an answer there. Because I'll take the all-pro guard over a fine tackle. But... Maybe with a couple years experience, he becomes a more than adequate, you know, Lane Johnson replacement and maybe a Pro Bowl guy. And at that point, all pro to, you know, maybe just a step below all pro tackle. I think you're getting about the same war, you know, wins above replacement. Uh, And then you're also addressing a position that is so hard to come by with tackles. And then you can patch up the interior offensive line. So I think it helps right now as an Isaac Sayamalu replacement. But also I think it brings some long-term value as a potential Lane Johnson replacement as well. All right. On to Tennessee here at pick 11. I'm going to go Jackson Smith to Jigba first. Wide receiver off the board. I do think that's how it's going to play out on April 27th. And, you know, we're going to talk about this more when we get to my big board next week. But he has moved up to my wide receiver too. And I'll kind of talk about that that and what's maybe changed my philosophy a little bit there. Um, But, you know, look, he's not the guy that's going to take the top off the defense, which is typically the wide receiver I mock to Tennessee. But man, he does just about everything else. I think he could be a really good run blocker, you know, six foot one, 200 pounds. He's a stout guy and he plays strong. I think he kind of gives you that Robert Woods value that I know they liked when they brought him into Tennessee last offseason. But obviously a guy who can win the short area, uh, great burst in and out of breaks. Uh, that first step out of a cut is so explosive. Six five seven three cone kind of bears that out. That was the athletic test to kind of confirm that. And for Tennessee, this whole offseason, season's been okay well we have to move on from the little one so we have to bring in a tackle Andre Dillard we lose Nate Davis we got to bring in a guard okay Brunskill we lose a linebacker David Long Jr we bring in one in Aziz Alshire it's just been kind of matching every loss and the one position they haven't done that with yet is wide receiver so I could see themselves thinking hey at 11 we're fine with Jackson Smith the Jigba hey Mike Vrabel also loves his Ohio State guys so this kind of matches up there and that's going to be our replacement for Robert Woods we're going to have him Traylon Burks they're going to be our headline wide receivers uh and then of course Derrick Henry still in town that's going to be the main identity of our team but I'm not done with Tennessee yet in this video so next up Houston at pick 12 let's give them Lucas Van Ness I think they kind of they could go Nolan Smith or Lucas Van Ness and I go back and forth basically I alternate between the mocks because I think either way you spin it it makes a lot of sense you get the high character guy who has insane explosiveness or Nolan Smith or the underrated athlete who has a really nice build really strong, great ability to turn speed to power at the line of scrimmage, uh, and a younger guy as well uh, in Luke's Van Ness. So it, it comes down to what flavor they want here on the edge. And also, you know, if we're talking about Houston trading up to get a quarterback, you know, maybe on Wednesday, I'll go quarterback at two. And then if if Tyree Wilson does fall, maybe make it to Atlanta at eight. I think Atlanta's open to fielding offers, moving back to 12. And then if, again, Tyree Wilson's on the board, if you saw my best defensive hits video, you know I love the idea of Tyree Wilson in that Houston defense and working under D'Amico Ryan. So maybe that's something I'll explore on Wednesday. But here, sticking and picking at 12, and I'll give him Lucas Van Ness to give him that power rusher they don't have right now. But it could easily be Nolan Smith at the same time. All right, then we get to the Jets at 13. No real surprise here. This is a pick I've mocked a ton. Broderick Jones. Yeah, uh, great on the move, insane athletic traits, big build, strong guy. I think uh, moving from a gap scheme at Georgia to a more zone blocking scheme with the Jets is going to be all the benefit for him. And also, depending on what they do with tackles, New York might give him the opportunity to kind of become more polished as a pass protector. Like if they think Makai Beckton's worth taking another swing of the bat on, you know, like giving him another year, you could roll it with him and Max Mitchell and buy Jones some time to kind of grow because, you know, his pass protection right now is a little raw. You know, his hand placement, he ducks his head a lot. Uh, so there's things to be cleaned up. But granted, those are pretty quick fixes and it may only take training camp or maybe it takes the first four weeks of the regular season or something along those lines. So uh, we'll just see how this tackle situation continues to play out for the Jets. But I think this is a situation where Jones can step into and not be forced into a starting spot right away, but also could be depending on what happens. And I think is a great fit for that blocking scheme. And you pair him up with 
Becton or you pair him up with Max Mitchell or Dwayne Brown, whoever it ends up being. I think you got a solid tackle tandem there for Aaron Rodgers, which, you know, uh, I wanted, we'll talk about it more in tomorrow's video. I wanted to take one of those second round picks after hearing Joe Douglas is saying, yeah, he's, you know, Rodgers is going to be in New York. I want to take one of those seconds and give it to Green Bay, but uh, Mock Draft Database is the uh, Mock Draft Simulator I use. They did not let me get away with that. So uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow as well as in the round three video because I had another idea. But anyways, let's talk about the New England Patriots and the trade I'm going to have them make. Uh, you know, I've had a couple mocks where Detroit is looking to make a splash. I had one where they traded back into the first round and, you know, had a, a third, you know, first round selection. And here, uh, I'm going to just give up their loan, or excuse me, their third first round selection, apologies. But here, I'm going to have them give up their third, move up from 18 to 14, because, you know, I don't think it's impossible that Christian Gonzalez falls a little bit. The traits are there, the upside's certainly there. Needs a little bit of work when it comes to his play, uh, but nevertheless, I think this guy is scheme versatile. Uh, and given his height, the arm length, the athleticism, um, and the ability to play press man, I think he makes for a really good fit in that Aaron Glenn defense. So as Gonzalez falls down the board to move up four spots, it only costs you pick 81. You have two second rounders. I think Detroit could swallow that pill and then even kind of position themselves later on in the draft, trade back from 48 or trade back from 55 and recoup some of that lost value. But now you're looking at a first round with Detroit getting Jalen Carter and Christian Gonzalez, my number one interior defensive lineman and my number one corner in this year's draft class. That sounds like a win in my books. Uh, and again, you know, I also like the idea of maybe trading back into the first round from 48 or something like that. But here, want to play around with something different. They have the ammunition when it comes to draft, uh, draft stock, and you know, Gonzalez after moving on from Okuda could be that you know first rounder that is the headline guy in that second year for years to come. Next, Green Bay. This one's an easy one. Nolan Smith. I uh, would make it four straight Bulldogs drafted by uh, Green Bay, which, you know, maybe that's a trend. Maybe it's just coincidence. You know, who knows? But I also think he could be that Preston Smith replacement. I know he's not necessarily the biggest and bulkiest guy, which has typically been something Green Bay's coveted. But at the same time, I think that explosiveness could deter them to look in a different direction and kind of um, forego maybe their past requirements. Um, and then he, as this kind of more quick, explosive, twitchy athlete versus Rashawn Gary, who you know wins with strength and has this insane build and a you know kind of a power rusher profile. I think that makes a nice one-two punch. And Preston Smith's too inconsistent for me uh, to be making the money that he's making. So and then Kingsley and Agbury was a guy I liked a lot. Uh, I hate that he fell to the third day of the NFL draft last year, but I think he's more than capable of being that third pass rusher. So Nolan Smith kind of eased into a role and then replaces Preston Smith in a year's time. And then it's, you know, Rashawn Gary, Pres or excuse me, Nolan Smith, and then uh, Kingsley and Agbury. To me, that makes for a really well-rounded rotation. And, you know, Nolan Smith, after seeing what Green Bay did with Rashawn Gary, they're getting a twitched up athlete here. I love to see what they do from a pass rush standpoint and really refining his game in that area. Next, we get to Washington. Uh, next couple of picks are really easy for me. You can easily flip them at the same time. Uh, Joey Porter Jr., I think could be fine for that cover three defense, but everyone's you know thinking about Joey Porter Jr. and man press, cover two, four, six off of it. Crazy arm length, uh, six foot two and a half, four, four, five, forty. Um, and for Washington, I think in this case, you're, you're willing to you know bite the bullet and say, yeah, we don't know his three cone, but we like the character. We like the you know prodigy's dad's you know an NFL player. Again, you could easily flip this pick and the next pick I'm going to make for the Steelers. Um, and we're going to say that yeah, he's a good enough athlete. He didn't run the three cone, but that's fine. We can trust that he's going to be able to plant his back foot and go make a play on the football, go make a play on a receiver, and be a fine fit. And give us a potential number one cornerback that then maybe we play St. Juice on the other outside boundary corner spot, move Kendall Fuller back inside where he's had some good years in the past. And that secondary takes a step forward and gets that much better uh, with that pass rush in front of it, hopefully with Chase Young staying healthy. I say this all the time, but that, that that's when this Washington defense becomes one of the best in the league. And then, you know, kind of clued in here, Pittsburgh, Deontay Banks, again, you could easily flip these two selections um, and I wouldn't hate it whatsoever. Um, but, you know, Banks, the reason I kind of wanted to make this selection is because because Maryland played so many, you know, different zone schemes mixed in with, you know, man a lot. Uh, so to have a diverse coverage background like Deontay Banks after the Steelers bring in Patrick Peterson, maybe this is more of a fit for what they're looking for. Okay, a guy that has the man coverage traits that we typically covet, but familiarity playing with a variety of zones. So maybe this team is going to pivot in a direction where they run more zone, trust their pass rush, let TJ Watt, let Cam Hayward and, and Alex Highsmith win them games. And then we're going to limit big plays and have, you know, Pat Peterson isn't the athlete he once was, but still a capable NFL athlete. And Deontay Banks is an insane athlete. And then we'll figure out kind of Arthur, Arthur Marlette, you know, is he going to play the nickel? Is he a full-time guy there? You know, all that stuff still needs to be figured out. But I think Banks could both maybe be the guy that old school man coverage, what they typically want, 
or be the guy that if Patrick Peterson is an indicator of what they want to do next year, a guy who fits in with a lot of zone heavy stuff too. So uh, a lot that remains to be seen with what Pittsburgh wants to do on the back end, but adding Deontay Banks is not going to be a bad addition whatsoever. Then we get to New England at 18. I'm going to have a repeat pick from last week, Zay Flowers. A lot of Patriots fans like that pick and, you know, that a top 30 visit with him. And I could see him being a guy that they like. He can win at multiple areas of the field, the underneath, yak stuff, um, and let Bill O'Brien kind of tap into some of the stuff that he did with Alabama there and some of their playmakers. But also, great over-the-top weapon, glides around the field. Him and Gonzalez say that about them all the time. They just move different than anybody else really in this class. Uh, and I think that over-the-top threat. You, you drafted Tyquan Thornton last year, but he's kind of straight line fast. Uh, I think Zay Flowers has a different dynamism to it and a lot more route running polish deep down the field. Uh, he's a little bit shorter, but I think still comes up with those circus catches, contested catch spots and uh, an okay clip. Uh, had some drop issues, but I don't think that's something that's going to be an issue at the NFL level. To me, that was him trying to carry Boston College uh, to a, a spot that the rest of that roster just wasn't able to compete at, you know? Um, so with him not having to play Superman in New England, I think you clean up those drops. And obviously for New England to trade back, garner an extra third round pick, and then still get to draft a wide receiver, which is among their most pressing needs. That's a big win. Uh, I know they had a top 30 visit with Will Levis, so we'll see. This quarterback situation after the trade rumors of Mac Jones, maybe they do opt in that direction. But I would soon, I would rather see this offseason be used as, hey, we're going to make a change at OC. We're going to get a first-round wide receiver in the building, and we're going to see what Mac Jones is about, as opposed to just giving up on him after you wasted his second year of his career. To me, that would be a little foolish. Then we get to Tampa Bay at pick 19, and I'm actually going to have another trade here. So uh, I waited a little bit on the trades because I could see the NFL draft. We kind of get a few picks in. We get a feel for, okay, how is this breaking? Where are we going? And then we could start seeing a bunch of trades later on uh, in the draft. Uh, later on in the first round, that is. So it's going to be pick 19 for 26, then 30. And then last week where I had Dallas give up a third and a fourth, this week it's just a third and a fifth. And the pick is going to be the same. It's B. John Robinson. I understand this is a deep running back class. And on Wednesday, I'm thinking about maybe Dwayne McBride. It's like a second round pick or even a third rounder. For Dallas, I think that would be a really fun duo. Dwayne McBride plus Tony Pollard. But here you get the best running back of the class. I think Jerry Jones is looking to make one more splash ad. You know, they make the trade for Gilmore. They make the trade for Brandon Cooks. Now you can make the trade up and have Cowboys fans forget about Zeke Elliott and add B. John Robinson, the best running back in this class with insane receiving ability and upside as well. And a one-two punch of Bijan plus Pollard in the backfield. I think that gives, especially in past situations, gives Dak Prescott a really easy avenue and a couple of you know, kind of safety blankets there in the backfield with them from a pass catching standpoint on top of the big playability that CD Lamb and uh, Brandon Cooks bring to the table. So love that addition. And, you know, for, you know, a third and then a fifth rounder for a roster that's pretty well rounded and they're going all in, you know, it's tough to justify three picks for one to draft a running back, but there's a team that could do it. They also have a good offensive line. Maybe Dallas is one of those suitors. Then we get to Seattle at 20, and I'm going to give them uh, a different player. I don't know if I've had a mock where I give them Jordan Addison. If I have, it's been a while. Uh, but to me, man, he he really could be that you know um, Tyler Lockett replacement. I, I feel like I say that about so many of their wide receivers. But I think you step in, you, you give Addison that immediate slot wide receiver role right off the jump. Uh, you get a crisp route runner and a guy who you can feel comfortable getting open pretty reliably. Uh, can push the ball down the field. I think he's faster than that 4 4 9 or the 4 5 time he ran at his pro day. Uh, and I think the NGS data would back that up. Um, and then when Tyler Lockett is no longer a Seattle Seahawk, whatever that, you know, whatever the means are to make that happen, I think Addison is more than capable of moving then outside or you keep him inside and Wherever he's playing, you have DK Metcalf plus someone else. Just when that offense last year, when it was just DK Metcalf, it, it got a little rough and it was a little too much work to put on one wide receiver. That's why we're trying to give the Vikings another wide receiver, right? Um, so I think this does make a lot of sense. Uh, and, you know, Addison slipping down boards, maybe could they wait? Maybe. But to me, I, I think once you get into the 20s, Addison's a good ad. You know, I know he's kind of had a tumultuous you know, draft circuit, but I still trust the tape. I still trust the player. And especially with his route running ability, I, there's some certainty value that comes with Jordan Addison and trusting that he's going to get open. And I think he's that third wide receiver behind Lockett and Metcalf. That's a scary offense. Uh, and it gives a lot, you know, you just extended Geno. Why not give him one more toy to play with, right? Then we get to the Los Angeles Chargers. I'm going to give him Dalton Kincaid. I do think speed wide receiver is something they should add. We'll do that in the day three or round three video. Uh, but, you know, this is a different way uh, of adding speed to that offense because 
Kincaid is a much better athlete than uh, that of Gerald Everett and uh, Donald Parham. Um, and, you know, the receiving, you know, upside for Kincaid, I think, is the highest of any of these tight ends. Uh, and he's probably the best on the run, yards after the catch-wise, uh, of any of the tight ends in this class. Uh, and, you know, I think about Kellen Moore coming over from Dallas to be the new OC in Los Angeles. And I think about how big of a role Dalton Schultz played in that offense. And I'm like, you know, Gerald Everett's not bad, but he's he's not that guy. And I don't think Donald Parham is either. So Kincaid, I think, has that potential and could give Kellen Moore that big piece of the offense that coming over from Dallas, looking at this LA offense, what's the main difference? I think tight end could be that spot. And I think 21 Kincaid, I think he could be the first tight end off the board. And I don't think this is terrible value. I'm a little bit lower on Kincaid. He's still one of the top three tight ends in this class, in my opinion. But nevertheless, he is tight end three for me. Uh, But I know a lot of people who want him going in the top half of the first round. So 21 to me doesn't feel like terrible value. Next, the Baltimore Ravens at 22. I'm going to give him Quentin Johnston. Uh, I've said this in the last couple of my videos where if Baltimore still goes wide receiver at 22, which I think they should heavily consider, that's when this offense gets scary. Because then you're talking about, in this case, Quentin Johnston, Rashad Bateman, Odell Beckham Jr., Mark Andrews, J.K. Dobbins, and then Lamar Jackson, assuming he's going to be there. That's when that offense is like, dude, how do you contain this? Because they have so many weapons that can win through the air, but they also have the most dynamic running quarterback in the game right now. Like, what are we supposed to do against that? Um, and, you know, Quentin Johnson kind of fits the MO of what the Ravens have tried to put around Lamar Jackson. 96 inch or 96 percentile wingspan. I think that's something that kind of comes into play when you have a quarterback that is. I think Lamar is a better passer than a lot of people want to give him credit for. But, you know, nevertheless, not the most polished or he's not Aaron Rodgers. You know, he, he is not, you know, Joe Burrow when it comes to his accuracy. So adding that guy with a big frame and, and that type of wingspan comes into play. Also, his yards after the catch ability, really different body than Devin DuVernay, but could he take some of that Devin DuVernay workload and some of those types of plays out of the offense? I'd be curious. Obviously, it's a change in OC, so it might look completely different. But you also add one more guy who can take the top off the defense for what's going to be a run-heavy offense. That ability is paramount. And I say this all the time about the Titans and the Ravens. You know, teams are going to play close to the line of scrimmage because you're a ground and pound team. So to have that counter, to have that guy that can take the top off the defense and make safeties pay for creeping to the line of scrimmage, I think that's a big add to the offense. And I know they added Nelson Aguilar, but that's a one-year deal. And Aguilar is so inconsistent. Let's let's go make a real upside swing here uh, of the bat with Quentin Johnston. Minnesota is not going to be picking here at 23. And as promised, this is where I'm going to have uh, our big splash trade from the Tennessee Titans um, trading back into the first. First round, it's going to be 23 for 41 and 72, and it could be even more because you can see the trade meter here. Nothing too too crazy, but we only go over the first three rounds anyways, so everything after this wouldn't be in the mock. So if you're a Vikings fan watching this, fill in whatever else you want to put in here. But I'm going to have Head and Hooker for the first time in any of my mocks go in the first round. I've been pretty slow to this just because he's my QB six. You know, I like Tanner McKee more than Hooker. Just my own evaluation of it. Uh, but man, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, and some smoke screens are just that. And then some, I think there's legitimate fire burning underneath it. I think Hennon Hooker has a real shot to go round one. Um, I do want to note that I think the fifth round, uh, the fifth year option is one of the most overrated talking points about this because, hey, look, he's 25. You're going to know by year 28 of his life, you know, like year three of the contract by the time he's 28, you're going to know if Hennon Hooker's the guy. You're, you're going to know three years in. Uh, so I think that fifth year option is totally overblown in this whole point. Uh, to me, this is more so Tennessee saying, hey, there's some teams that could be kind of sneaky uh, and move back in the first round or some teams, maybe even late round one that could make a play. Uh, we could even see teams trade back from earlier in the first to position themselves where they feel more comfortable drafting Hennon Hooker. So a lot of different areas in which this could play out, but there's a lot of love for Hennon Hooker going round one. And hey, he did have a good year at Tennessee and uh, you know has the big arm, throws over the middle of the field with the best of them in this class. Very accurate, sneaky, athletic. Um, I just worry about him and that translation from a Josh Heupel offense to something at the NFL level. So um, there is some concerns, but... For Tennessee, you can kind of buy him a year, let him learn the playbook, start Ryan Tannehill, or you just move on from Tannehill. And also, I just want to note, this is not me saying, oh, the Tennessee guys got to stay in Tennessee and play in Nashville and go to the Titans. That really didn't factor in it, but it's just more of a cool occurrence. Uh, so Titans fans, let me hear it down below. You're done for this mock draft. You're not picking round two or round three, but I do hope you come back and check out the other videos. But you end the first round with JSN and Hendon Hooker. How would you feel about those two players going to Tennessee? I'd be fascinated to hear your feedback and your thoughts uh, as I, you know, get one last crazy exploratory uh, exploratory uh, move in the mix here in my mock drafts. Then we get to the Jags, and this is anything but bold and adventurous and different than what I've done in the past. Brian Branch, yep, my favorite player to team landing spots. Uh, you know what? Every other mock I see now talks about how much they love Brian Branch and the fit with the Jags, so... 
I guess everyone else is seeing the same thing. But uh, yeah, it really rounds out that secondary, uh, both from the cornerback standpoint, but also the safeties that they already have on roster who, you know, Cisco's a bit of a question mark and Rayshon Jenkins, who I'm not really crazy about considering the money he makes. I think Brian Branch can fill in and, you know, eventually be a replacement for him, but also immediately play that nickel role that they're kind of missing. Keep Darius Williams on the outside where he plays better. Yeah, I love this fit. I've talked about it a thousand times before. Then we get to the Giants at 25, and I'm going to give him John Michael Schmitz. Uh, I do think there is a, you know, interior offensive lineman that's going to go round one, and JMS is actually going to be the only interior offensive lineman I'm going to have go round one. I'm going to have Torrance fall out of the first, which is plausible. I have a bet actually on the channel with uh, subscriber James Vallis, so shout out to James. Uh, This is going to be a mock that will surely make you happy because of our bet. But nevertheless, Tampa Bay then at 26. Actually, let me talk about more about John Michael Schmitz. You know, for the Giants, you know, it's the one position on their offensive line that's like, yeah, you got to fix that. Uh, I think they can get better at left guard, but right now center is sticking out like a sore thumb. I think adding John Michael Schmitz, good blocking fit or scheme fit for that blocking scheme, uh, and it just addresses that last glaring hole in the offensive line. That This has kind of been a retool of that O-line for the last three years. So let's go ahead and you know, get as close to finishing as you're really probably ever going to get, you know, considering there's always going to be one spot you feel like you can get better at. Uh, and, you know, hey, you'd pay Daniel Jones, your franchise tag, Saquon Barkley. Adding a center is only going to make those two guys uh, that much better. Then we get to Tampa Bay here at 26. And I'm going to go Darnell Wright. He kind of fell down the board here. And I believe the hype for Darnell Wright. Uh, and, you know, Chris Sims, his top offensive tackle. You're starting to see a lot of love. Uh, a lot of people's position rankings. And he's shooting up mock draft boards. Uh, I, nothing against Darnell Wright. I just kind of had him fall here. <laughs> but in this situation, Tampa Bay gets to trade back and still get one of the premier tackles in this year's class. Um, and while doing it, you know, you're going to have to move Tristan Wirfs over to left tackle. But... I don't think that's a bad idea uh, whatsoever. I think he'll be able to make that flip totally. I, I have full faith and confidence that Tristan Wirfs is going to be just fine and just as good at left tackle for that matter. Uh, so pairing up right with Wirfs, that's an awesome tackle duo for the future. Uh, and it gives Baker Mayfield a standing shot. You know, it gives Kyle Trask an actual offensive line maybe in front of him to see what he's all about. And then more realistically, when it comes to Tampa Bay, it gives them a awesome offensive tackle duo. It was still some work on the interior offensive line I think they could have. But also if you're picking towards the top of the 2024 you know, draft board, we're not going to see Caleb Williams or Drake May get murdered pretty much right away, which would be good. Next up, uh, Buffalo. I'm going to give them Jack Campbell. Really wanted to make this pick last week, but I had the Lions snipe them uh, after a trade down uh, moving to 26. Uh, but for Campbell, this is kind of a great Tremaine Edmonds replacement may not be quite the athlete that Edmonds is, but has that same size and weight and height that goes with it. Shorter arms too. That's one of the other big things that stuck out when you look at their athletic profiles and their body builds. But I think that's fine. You have Matt Milano as the coverage specialist there, uh, and Jack Campbell's focus is going to be stopping everything in front of him, right? He's going to be the the run defense reinforcements, which is big, right? Like, this team wants to play a lot of too high. So uh, it starts with the defensive tackles, but also, like, that inside linebacker that can clean up the second level and allow you to play with that second safety back is big for that defense. Uh, And, man, I'm a big fan of Jack Campbell. And, honestly, I feel comfortable with saying he's going to be the first linebacker off the board. Uh, I still like Trenton Simpson as the best off-ball linebacker. Because I like the size and I like the speed. The 4 4 3 40 is always sticking out to me. Uh, and I think there's a good feel for it there uh, in zone coverage. But, you know, Campbell plays well in zone coverage. And because we know after the combine he's not as bad of an athlete that we thought he was, I think he'll hold up in zone coverage. And then that, you know, 95th percentile three cone, I think that says it all. Read and react, find the ball carrier, and go make a play on him. Uh, and I think that's a perfect skill set to complement what Matt Milano is and brings to the table at that other linebacker spot. Then we get to Cincinnati. I'm going to do something I haven't done yet. Kalijah Cansey. Could you imagine an interior duo of DJ Reader and Kalijah Cansey? That is an awesome, and I mean awesome, one-two punch. Reader's a really nice run stopper when he's healthy, but has a little bit of pass rush juice to him. Like, he's a little overlooked in that realm. And then Kalijah Cansey, you know, just focusing on Reader being a good run stopper. I think that kind of frees up Cansey to focus on his pass rush. Uh, and, you know, shorter, shorter arms and a lighter weight uh, guy for sure, but... I think uh, with Reader being able to keep him clean in the run defense side of it, that allows him, again, to just kind of focus on being a pass rusher. And yeah, three percentile arm length isn't ideal, but I think he has a great you know, arsenal of moves, knows his hand placement, uh, and that get off of the line of scrimmage makes up for it. Uh, because, yeah, you may be able to get your hands on him first, but that's only if he's not already into your chest, you know? Uh, so I think Kalaja Kansi has the skill sets to overcome maybe his other shortcomings in his frame. Uh, and again, him plus DJ Reader on the inside, really nice complementary skill sets, but also Reader's an underrated pass rusher. And you already have Trey Hendrickson. You already have Sam Hubbard, who's a fine player. And you have a couple other, you know, day two picks from years ago. Um, that's a really well-balanced and deep defensive line. Uh, and for the Bengals, you know, they're going to be winning a lot of games. They're going to be playing ahead in a lot of games. So to have a deep 
elite pass rush, you know, rotation, both on the edge and on the inside, it'll go a long way to making sure that Cincy stays top of the AFC. Next, New Orleans at 29, and I'm going to give him Brian Brzee. He kind of fits, you know, I talked about this with, you know, uh, Miles Murphy too, where both these guys from Clemson are, you know, have the frame, have the athleticism, so naturally kind of New Orleans immediately comes to mind. And both positions are positions of need, right? Like New Orleans could add a third edge rusher in the Knicks, uh, or they could find that David Onyemata replacement opted to go with Brzee as that Onyemata replacement, clearing hole there at defensive tackle. And I don't think Kalen Saunders is the fix there. Um, so let's go bank on the upside that Brzee brings to the table. Six foot five, three hundred plus pounds, and this dude has gone through so much. One, you know, I don't really think Clemson did their job developing a lot of the guys on the defensive line, um, and you know, this guy who moved across the D line had injuries, had that family tragedy that he had to play through thereafter. I, I don't know if we really got to see him hit a developmental curve. So maybe he hits the ground running at the NFL level because he gets like the coaching and the development that he actually needs, right? Like maybe he just never got that opportunity and never had the time to kind of soak in that coaching uh, at the college level because of the injuries and all the other stuff that he battled through. But that being said, it easily could be Miles Murphy here at 29. I decided to make that the pick here for Philadelphia at 30. You could easily flip these two. And I'd almost be interested, Brzee plus Jordan Davis, that'd be a fun inside tan up there. So I really almost did flip these. I'd be fine with it either way. If you're a Saints fan, let me know your preference for Z versus Murphy. And if you're an Eagles fan, let me know who would you rather have uh, fall to you at 30. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But again, both guys are twitched up athletes with an awesome frame, but are unrefined from a pass rush standpoint. Both bring a lot, I think, uh, pretty much right away in the run defense area, but you're just going to have to work on them as a pass rusher. Uh, for New Orleans, Brzee's your Onyemata replacement. And for Philadelphia, um, you're just adding potential Brandon Graham replacement, a guy who also has you know high-end athletic traits. So maybe he's kind of that speed rusher to replace Brandon, uh, or excuse me, Robert Quinn. But I think this guy plays with power right away. So to me, I'm kind of thinking this is your Brandon Graham replacement. Um, and then you kind of you put him in a situation where he doesn't have to see the field all that much right away. He plays 400, 500 snaps his rookie year. And let's develop him as a pass rusher, both with their coaching staff that's done a great job developing other pass rushers, but also just working with the other guys in that rotation. Like, you know, just having him work with Derek Barnett and Josh Sweat and, you know, Brandon Graham and all those other pieces already there in Philadelphia. I think give him a year and Miles Murphy could really hit the ground and start running in Philadelphia. And then, you know, again, he's that Brandon Graham replacement, got a one-year extension. It just kind of works out timing-wise perfectly. Last pick of the first round video is going to be Mozzie Smith. I talked about last week, I wanted to get Mozzie in the first round and I have done it. Uh, you know, and Derek Nadi is, I guess, fine, serviceable as a run defender. I do think Mozzie Smith brings more in that area. Plus, then we're talking about Bruce Feldman's number one, you know, freak athlete uh, and the pass rush upside that comes with that. So uh, to me, he kind of is too inconsistent. And there's some games where he really wants it and some games where he kind of tapers off and you, you kind of forget that he's on the field. But nevertheless, you know, pairing up with Chris Jones, well, I think that's a mentor mentee relationship that could uh, even out that consistency a whole lot more. Uh, and while the Chiefs could certainly go edge. I think interior defensive line is another area where they could uh, stand to find an upgrade. And then you can go edge later on in this draft class where there is a little bit more depth. But, guys, that is going to do it for round one of my updated 2023 NFL mock draft. Be sure to come back tomorrow for round two, then Sunday for round three. But hopefully you all enjoyed. Be sure to hit that like button if you did. It'll help out me and the channel a ton. Subscribe if you're new, looking for more draft content, more football coverage in your life in general. And, of course, most importantly, leave your thoughts down below in the comments section. Who went too high? Who went too low? Who surprised you maybe uh, as a first round pick in this video and of course who's your favorite team and did you like the pick that i made your squad and then titans eagles and, and saints fans and some of those other squads that i called out specifically let me hear your thoughts in specific on the pick that i made for your team and titans let me hear what you think about uh the trade back in the first round for hendon hooker but that is gonna do it for me hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and until next time my name is teach and i am signing off <laughs>